morning. See Brother Dan sitting up here on the front row. He said he was sitting in the back row. But uh, hope everybody's doing well this morning. Uh, when I talked to Dan last week about speaking today, there were only like six of us here last week, so a little bit a uh, little bit bigger crowd. Um, the song our singing I just kind of reminded me of a a little story just right off the top of my head real quick before we get started. Uh, somebody was telling me about a uh, a children's Sunday school, and they were talking about uh, one of the questions they were asking and they were discussing was does God have an actual name and not expecting an answer and one of the young ones says raise his hand so yes he does well okay I'll, what, what do you think his what's his name his name must be Andy Andy I didn't come up with Andy he says right there in the song Andy walks with me Andy talks with me <laughs> Andy tells me I'm his own so anyways I thought that was a cute little story uh, first of all, I want to thank Dan for allowing me to come up here today, or not allowing me, but for encouraging me to come up here today. Um, <coughs> this is uh, what I want to share with you today is something that has been on my mind and my heart for a while, uh, and, and he and I have discussed it, uh, John, we've discussed it several times, a lot, and, and uh, I appreciate the support and of everyone, uh, those guys uh, have been very, very good for me. I feel really blessed to have been led to be here in Turpin, and and I hope to be here for a, a long while. And I had the opportunity this summer to go to Falls Creek with an outstanding group of people, uh, outstanding youth, uh, outstanding sponsors, <coughs> outstanding cooks. Uh, it was just, uh, couldn't have been an, uh, any better experience. And while I was there, uh, we, we had the opportunity to listen to a, a very dynamic uh, young preacher by the name of Ed Newton. Uh, and the message uh, that he brought all week uh, was a resounding message, and it has resonated with me uh, continually. And as I come back to our community, in our church, in our town, I see the, the, the correlation there, and, and I think it's a message that I want to share, and, and God has, taught, has led me to share with you today. Now, those of you who have gone through recent Bible studies with Brother Dan, you guys have studied Revelations for, it would take you like four years, something like that, so... You guys are going to know this, but what I'm going to, what I want to give you, I want to give you maybe a different perspective, a different way to kind of look at some of these things. And so today, uh, we're going to, I want to start by discussing the church. And what is a church? Church is not the building, church is not the pulpit, church is not the floors, the pews, the church is the people. So when, the, when we talk about the church, we talk about the church in the Bible, the Bible talks, the church is talking about the, it's talking about the people. All the people and those that are around them and those that they have influence over to become the church. What is the condition of our church? The condition of our church these days, in today's times, is not where it should be, plain and simple. Too many churches are shiny on the outside, but not shiny or rotten on the inside. See, all things, almost all things, when they rot, they don't rot from outside in. They rot from the inside out, okay? And that's where a lot of our churches are today. Eighty percent of Americans will tell you that they are Christian. Eighty percent. Does that reflect in our country? Does that reflect in our behaviors? Can you, can you go outside and see 80% of the people behaving and acting like Christians? I don't think so. So, as I go through the message today, and I go through these, we're going to talk about 
uh, Jesus' message, messages to the seven churches of Asia in Revelation. As we go through these, everyone will fit in somewhere. Everybody sitting here will fit in somewhere, in with one of these churches, in with one of these uh, the behavior patterns that are in these churches. So as we go through, I'd like for you to, to really feel like, really think about and put some hard thought into where you fit in. All right, we'll be in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, this will be quite a, a heavy scripture message. Uh, I, I'm not as well versed as our normal pastor, and so I have relied a lot on scripture uh, to, to help me with this. So it will be heavy on the, uh, the scripture side. But we'll be in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelations and discussing the seven messages, the messages sent to the seven churches of Asia. Jesus sent these messages. John wrote them in 95 A.D. And this is a time where the church of Jesus Christ was growing despite persecution, despite the doubt amongst the believers that they could handle the persecution, but the church was still growing. And as the church was growing, so was the, the, the level of that persecution. Uh, Jesus selected these churches because each one of them had some sort of characteristic or, or something that was representative of the conditions of the spiritual uh, conditions which existed at that time. And the thing is, those spiritual ex conditions still exist today. You'll see it in our church. You'll see it in other churches. You'll see it in everywhere. Okay? So that's why Jesus selected these seven churches. All right? So again, try to uh, maybe put a lot of thought into where you might fit in. I'm going to start with Ephesus, also known as the Loveless Church. Revelations 2, verse 1 to 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It wasn't a bad thing. Jesus wasn't condemning them. But the message was this. He said, hey, you have five good qualities. You're dynamic. You're dedicated. You're determined. Disciplined and discerning. Okay? But, but. They failed in the fact that they left their first love. They left their first love and strayed away from Jesus and the teachings. First love should always be Jesus. That's the lesson out of that. And they left that. I'd like to move along to Smyrna or the persecuted church. It's Revelations 2. Verse 8 through 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Smyrna was suffering persecution like no other. Smyrna, uh, its proximity to the Roman gatherings in the Roman Empire, they were suffering more than most. And the message was simple. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. You will be persecuted, but do not fear. Indeed, the devil is about to throw you some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. See, Christ is Lord over all circumstances. I believe that. Christ is Lord over all circumstances. Therefore, there's nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The message here, the underlying message, and this applies to us every day. Stay true to the things that are right and see it through to the end. Always at the end, reward awaits you. Anything that's worthwhile, anything that you put your time in, anything you see through to the end, there is a reward. Know that. Everything in your personal life, see it through to the end, there will be a reward. Third church, Church of Pergamos, the compromising church. Revelations 2, 12 to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You see, all these so far, Jesus has appeared to each one of these churches in different form. He who holds the candlesticks, the seven stars. He with the sword, okay? It's kind of like when, when you, uh, you know, there's different ways that you have to talk to different people. Some people understand this way. Some people understand this way. This is the approach uh, that Jesus has taken in these messages. Pergamos was nicknamed Satan's city. Although the people there were Christian. They had allowed paganism, they had allowed idolatry to come into their church and into their community. They were a Christian. Why would they do that? Why, if you're Christians, why not stay the course? They did it because it was easy. You see, it was easier. They're facing persecution. And in that persecution, 
it's easier to go alone. It's easier to let, I'll just let them do what they're going to do. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say anything. You see, it's easier. We get into that today. We get into that today. As we walk out of these doors, if we are true Christians and we walk out of these doors and we behave like true Christians, are we lifted up by the world today? No. We're challenged by the world today. We're challenged by the world today. And you know what? It's easy. It's easier not to accept that challenge. And then so we just fall back into that, uh, you know, we'll just let them do their thing. Okay? That's not what Jesus wants. That's not what Jesus wants. See, Satan is, Satan is still employing that same strategy today. Satan is still employing that same strategy. What can't be cursed or crushed can't be corrupted through compromise. If I can't stop it myself, then I'm going to stop it from within. That's Satan's attitude. Be corrupted by compromise. Wherever two or three gather together in Christ's name, Satan will be there to try to corrupt the truth. Know that. Be ready for that. As Christians, we shouldn't be combative or antagonistic against corruption or compromise, but be vigilant and sober and on guard, ready to speak the truth in love. It's not a fight. It is a fight in a way, but speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. This is, if you get confrontational, then you're buying into what they want from you. Does that make sense? So, never compromise your faith and stand for the belief. Stand for your belief. Stand for the things you believe in. Fourth church, Thyatira, or the corrupt church. This is Revelations 2, 18 to 29. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Again, presenting himself in a way or in a, in, in a, in a manner that this church will understand better. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit immoral acts and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent her immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit uh, it, adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now I say to you, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put, you, put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my work until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thyatira allowed an immoral individual to lead many away from the church. Why? Again, it was easier. It was easier to follow. See, it's, it's about, it, it, it's not about the feeling, it's about the work. It's about, this is what I need to do. This is how I need to be. 
And sometimes that's hard. You can all relate because all of you have some kind of job. doesn't matter what you do or have had some kind of job. All of you can relate to that. Sometimes your job is hard. There's a certain way you have to do things. There's a certain way you should do things. But sometimes that's hard. Can't take the easy way out of your job. Take the easy way out of your job, you'll get fired. See, you have to do it. This is no different. His message was, repent your immorality. Again, all the things that's going on, Jesus is still there. Never left. Still there. Doesn't matter what's going on, Jesus is there. Repent your immorality. Very simple. Very simple message. Repent your immorality. Or face great tribulation. Hebrews 10.31 it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He comes to me and says, repent your immorality or face the consequences. Okay? That's what we have to do. Then he turns around and tells those who have stayed true and have persevered, hold fast what you have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. Stay the course. Hold fast, and you will be rewarded in the end. Stay the course. That's the message. Fifth church, Sardis, the dead church, Revelations 3, 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Up until Sardis, Jesus had commendations for the churches. You're doing this, you're doing these things well, you're doing this, but this is where you have failed. This is the first church where Jesus has no commendations. Very simple. Verse, very first verse. I know your works. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now, they weren't physically dead, but they were spiritually dead. You see, this church was full of what we might today call nominal Christians. Nominal Christians. Those ones, those people that they come in the door on Sunday mornings, they put on their Jesus coat, we talked about, put on their Jesus coat, and they sit in church, and, you know, they're warmed up, and they're fired up, and those things, and then when it's time to leave, they hang that Jesus coat right back on the rack. See, those are nominal Christians. Quick to tell you, very Christian, very slow to act on it. The main message here, know that there is still hope. Take that Jesus coat out the door with you and share it with somebody else. Repent and know that there's hope and light at the end of the tunnel. 
6 church, Church of Philadelphia, the faithful church. Revelations 3, 7 to 13. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things says, He who is holy, he is true. He who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, Philadelphia was the most disciplined, the most faithful of all the churches. And the message to them, they had four positives. They have an open door policy. In other words, they welcome people into their church, and they shared the word openly. They had a little strength, which provided them enough strength to hold their doors open at time of persecution. Understand, this is a time of persecution. They kept the word of God, and they did not deny the Lord. See, the presence of Christ anywhere, the presence of Christ, two things, the presence of Christ and the commitment to him can open the doors of opportunity for ministry anywhere, here, anywhere. Those two things. See, a lot of churches today, a lot of churches today, they think there's too few people, uh, too little money, too few gifts. Uh, not enough opportunities. We can't do this. We can't do that. But here's the simple truth. That may be true. We may we may not have much money. You know, the economy. We don't have money. We don't have these things. But when we are weak or little, Christ is strong and big. When the Word of God is the first priority. When the Word of God is the first priority. Everything else will fall into place. That's the message. That's what you need to know. doesn't matter our size. doesn't matter if we have one person, two person, 150 people. It doesn't matter as long as we put God's word first. We must proclaim Christ as the Bible does, the only name whereby we can be saved. Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You have, we have to turn towards Jesus. We have to come closer to Jesus. We have to believe that no matter what our size, no matter what our tribulations, no matter what our problems, that is the answer. Now, the church of Philadelphia, the downside, and this is is not necessarily expressed by Jesus, but the downside of that church, they had an open door policy. They were great. They let people in. Which way did the doors flow, though? Which way did the doors open? See, the church of Philadelphia they didn't go out the doors enough. See, that's great. We can bring all the people we want in here, but we got to get them to come in. And to do that, we have to go out. We have to go out. We can't just say, hey, come see us. This is great. We have to go out. 
we have to display. We have to show. We have to lead by example. Not by words. Not by opening our doors. We have to go out. People of Philadelphia, they're one of these seven churches. They're right there together. They're not next door, but they're within traveling distance. All the things going on that we've talked about in the other churches. But they go out and help them. You see what I'm saying? It's they, were, they felt like they were too small or too little. So we have to go out, guys. We have to go out. We have to go out and we have to be strong in the face of adversity. The last church, the seventh church, Laodicea. The lukewarm church. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I will tell you, this is what resonated with me the most. Lukewarm church. Now, in... The, the church of Laodicea was lacking in just about every way. All the ones we talked about before kind of put them together. So they were compromising, they were conceited, they were corrupt, and they were Christless. And they were struggling spiritually. Now, Laodicea was very wealthy, actually one of the richest cities in Asia. They're at the crossroads of major trade routes, center of banking and finance, uh, known for making clothes. Uh, They had a a medical school, really well-known medical school. Matter of fact, they even had an earthquake one time, destroyed the entire city. They refused the Romans' help. They just paid for it themselves. We'll rebuild our own city. That's the kind of wealth we're talking about. See, they had become rich in a material sense, so they felt like they didn't need anything else. A lot of times we do that. We get You see people in our country, the people in our, you know people. Most of you probably know somebody like that. It's like, I'm wealthy, I don't need anything else. I've got all I need. I've got a, a huge house, I've got a five-car garage, I've got motorcycles, boats, RVs. i got all I need. I don't need anything else. See, that's the way they were. Okay, but verse 15, verse 15 says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Verse 16, so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, it's a simple meaning here, and this is, this is one of the big twists that really got me thinking about things. See, it's a big twist here because in saying that, Jesus is saying, I know that you're neither on fire for me or you're cold away from me. That's the simplest uh, message, and that is what he's trying to say. But 
want you to think about this. This is actually a literal reference. It's a literal reference because Laodicea is located, was located between two other cities, you see. Hierapolis and Colossa, who supplied it with its water. Both these towns supplied it with its water through an aqueduct system that they used their money to build, and they brought water in from both places. Here's the thing. Hierapolis had a natural hot spring. All their water was warm. Piped in, down this long aqueduct, coming to Laodicea. Colossae is located on a river, cool river water. Cool river water brought in by this aqueduct, traveling over miles. So, by the time the hot water came from the hot spring, the cold water came from the river, and they met at Laodicea, it was literally lukewarm. Literally lukewarm water. And about like, probably like what a good bath would be, maybe. So the message that I got from it. Here's the thing. It's not about the cold and the hot. It's about the source. Everybody with me? It's about the source. It's about if I'm hot here, the further I get away from that source, the less that I have. It doesn't matter. If I'm cold here, the further I get away from that source, the warmer I get. You see? It's not about being on fire. It's not about being cold. It's about being at the source. And to get that what you want, you have to get back to that source. That's the message. That's the message. Because we, as a, heck, as a people, we are getting further away from our source. We're getting further away from God. Turn on the TV. Turn on the news. Read a paper. It take long to find somebody drifting extremely far away from God. We are getting further and further away from God. This was the real truth for all seven churches, as well as us today. Verse 18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, white garments that you may be clothed, the shame of your nakedness that may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyes have that you may see. Jesus is giving these directions to the Laodiceans as a way to let, get them to let go of their materials. You don't need these things to get closer to the source. That's what he said. You don't need these things to get closer to the source. See, all seven churches fell short in some way, just like we do. We do it every day, everybody in here. There is no perfect we all fall short every day simply because they drifted away from the source of their true salvation. See, our spirit is like the gold of Laodicea in a sense that uh, when they pull gold and silver out of the ground, it's impure. It's impure. When it's placed in a fire, which for us would be God's love, when it's placed in that fire, all the impurities rise to the top and are swept away, taken away. That's at the source. Psalm 66, 10 through 12 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. This is how you obtain salvation. Turn to God. Get to the source. Let him take away those impurities. We'll never be perfect because we're all human beings. But that doesn't mean we can't continue to work at it. See, that's the thing. I've always believed that life is about the work. Put the effort into it. You put effort in. If you want something... You go out, uh, people will work two, three jobs so they can get something. They put extra time in for that. 
Why can't you put extra time in for God? We have to work at it. Colossians 3.23, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to man. Wouldn't it be great if we would work for the God like we work for man? That's what we need. We have to work harder and do more to get closer to the source of that everlasting life. Now, here's the thing. Some of you, somebody, may have never experienced that source. A lot of us need to get back to it. We've experienced it, but we need to get back to it. But what if you've never experienced that source before? There's only one way. There's only one way to get to that source. Only one way, and that's to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is no other way. Doing great things, doing good things, not good enough. You hear that almost every week. Dan puts that somewhere in every week. It's not good enough. You can go out and be the greatest person, father, president, company leader, uh, boss, worker, whatever. You can do all those things. You can be the best at everything you do. It's not good enough. It's great, but it's not good enough. You cannot be saved until you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. If there's someone here today that wants to do that, please come forward. Talk with Dan. Would you guys please stand for invitation? If you feel like that you are drifting, you are one of those drifting away from the source. That's possible. Just because you've accepted Jesus doesn't mean that you've quit, you, you can quit working. If you feel like you need to work some more, if you feel like you need to get back to that source, find your way back. Come up and visit. We'll pray with you.